Thank you for joining us for this time of worship. Uh, this will be a worship service based on the gospel reading for the Sunday after Easter. Just to introduce the folk that are sharing in leadership, uh, first you'll hear from Reverend Mark Cornford. Mark is the Presbytery Minister of the Morton Rivers Presbytery. Then you'll hear, uh, reading the scriptures, uh, Janelle Vandervelt, who is the Executive Director of Shared Services in the Synod Office. I'll be leading you in a short reflection. We'll hear a piece of music from uh, the Leichhardt Uniting Church in Sydney. And then Reverend Karen Seto, the Synod Chaplaincy Coordinator, uh, will be leading you in a prayer. And I'll finish with a word of mission and a word of blessing. I'm on the outside, uh, out in the open. Uh, but Mark has set a scene uh, reminiscent of the upper room uh, that, that uh, evening uh, after, the, uh, after the resurrection. As we come in worship, we come remembering how on that Sunday night the disciples met behind closed doors, met in fear, yet Jesus appeared amongst them, bringing words of peace, but not just words of peace, words of mission and the breath of the Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you are the God who breaches closed doors. You are the God who brings words of peace to those who are in fear. You are the God who brings words of mission to those who are in hiding. You are the God who brings the breath of your Holy Spirit to those people who are overwhelmed. We worship you because your love overwhelms us and draws us to you. You are the God of resurrection power, and we are your people. But as we come to worship you, Lord, we come aware of our own failings, our own inadequacies, and so we come to you with our prayer of confession. We confess that we fear loneliness and don't trust your presence. We confess that we fear loss of material possessions and don't trust your providence for us. We confess that we fear these new and difficult times and don't trust that you are Lord of all. We confess that we fear death and don't trust that the power of your love and redemption, that nothing can stop you and your love, not even death. We come to you in this time confessing our need of you your grace and mercy. We come to you, though, in this time, secure in your great love for us. So we bring to you now our prayers of silent confession. Lord, you have heard the silent prayers of our heart of our hearts. And because of Easter Sunday, we hear Christ's words of mercy to us. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The Gospel reading for today comes from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31, and reading from the New Revised Standard Version. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. It's a bit wry listening to this story in the environment in which we're in at the moment, isn't it? Uh, the disciples are behind locked doors. We're supposed to be uh, at home, uh, socially isolated. Uh, Jesus comes, stands amongst them, so he breaks our current rules. Uh, and then even worse, uh, he breathes on them. Uh, and you go, uh, wow, um, uh, our uh, state health uh, director would not be happy with this behaviour if it was happening today. So it's kind of wry reading uh, this kind of uh, message, uh, this kind of this story uh, at this time. But it's a very powerful story. And it's a story uh, that in, particularly in the way John has written his gospel that, that establishes us as God's people. For here Jesus comes to his disciples who are confused, who don't know what to do next. And he establishes them as the people of God called into a ministry in the world. This is John's Pentecost. And uh, so in this story, Jesus first establishes us as being reconciled to God. Peace is the message I have for you, he says to his disciples. And then he commissions them, as he commissions us, to be peacemakers in the world, to be agents of reconciliation. This is our fundamental journey, our fundamental call as the people of God. And in some senses, you know, we all pray for peace and we all say peace is wonderful. Uh, it's a kind of platitude in the statement today. But I want to remind you that peacemaking and the work of reconciliation is tough work. It's, work. it's the work of people who are courageous. It's the work of people who are confident in the faithfulness of God, in the goodness of God. It's the work of people who have, uh, are ready to let go of what they think should happen to co-create a new story with others. The work of peacemaking is deeply challenging. And I just want to remind you of some of the peacemakers of the last uh, few years and what's happened to them. Anwar Sadat, the leader of, of Egypt. Yitzhak Rabin, the leader of Israel. Gandhi, the leader of his people. Martin Luther King Jr. Three of those people were killed by their own people for seeking to bring peace and reconciliation with those their people feared. So this work of peacemaking isn't um, a Pollyanna exercise. It's a tough journey and it's a hard journey and it's a journey that requires an utter confidence in the capacity of God to be at work in the world. And it's the work that you and I have been called to. It's the work that you and I are called to bear witness to day by day. You can't have peace without justice. And so the work of making sure that we are living fairly with one another, in equity with one another, is a part of the work of reconciliation and peacemaking. But the point of this passage is to lay this work firmly and squarely in the hands of us, the people of Jesus Christ, and to call us to be those people in the world. One day I'm hoping for this. One day I'm hoping that uh, in the wider community in which we Christians live across the world, when people are in conflict, they'll say, let's go and ask the Christians. They know how to live at peace with one another. They know all about reconciliation. Let's ask them. So what is it about our life that we need to express and do so that that witness might be evoked in the life of the wider world? That's a challenge. That's a question I want to ask of you. For in John's Gospel, it's very clear. We're called 
into the dangerous, challenging, fruitful and blessed work of peacemaking. That's our call. So the second part of this story is uh, one of my favourite stories, really, because uh, it's the story of Thomas encountering the risen Lord. And in many ways, Thomas is our man on the spot. Uh, for we who live post the Ascension, uh, post uh, Pentecost, we who have not had an experience of the resurrected Christ, uh, concretely and tangibly before us, uh, Thomas functions here, I think, in this story as our guy. Because he says to the disciples who said they've seen the Lord, yeah, right, you're kidding yourself. Uh, unless I experience it, um, I think you're all in uh, cloud cuckoo land. And so Jesus comes and represents himself to Thomas. And I think uh, maybe with a little bit of rebuke in the tone uh, of Jesus, uh, Jesus invites him to touch, to encounter the concrete reality of the resurrected Jesus. And Thomas, uh, good on him, uh, responds with faith. And it's very important, the words that he says. He responds with the words, my Lord and my God. And here John is saying, calling us, the church, to understand our fundamental allegiance. John's Gospel was probably written in a time when uh, the Roman Empire was calling the fundamental allegiance of people to itself, to the emperor, as the son of God. So this statement by Thomas is, is not simply a statement of personal faith, it's a statement of political reality. And it's for us in the Western world, particularly as the nation states have become so strong and so dominant in our life, it's for us as the Christian church to remember that our fundamental allegiance uh, is to the God revealed in Jesus Christ. And we interpret and understand all the other allegiances which we're called to. And uh, some are absolutely right, but we do never give ourselves fundamentally to anyone or anything else but the God revealed in Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to be uh, reflecting on that, that sense of who am I? Am I a citizen of uh, Australia who happens to be a follower of Jesus? Or am I a follower of Jesus who's called to bear witness uh, to the goodness of God in this nation and as a citizen, as a part of the life of this nation, Australia? I think this passage and Thomas's confession and his presence reminds us and calls us to uh, knowing and understanding our fundamental allegiances. For we, if we of the church are going to be of any blessing and of any uh, contribution to the health and well-being of our communities and of our societies, it is as we understand our fundamental mission, that is to be peacemakers. To those who see and understand when violence or coercion or manipulation is being played to resist it, to see it and know it and to resist it in a way of non-violence. And it is for us to understand ourselves as the people of God on the journey towards the promised city, towards the promised goal, a goal that God will bring. So it helps us be who we are, I think, this passage in the life of the world and calls us to remember a number of fundamental things. So I pray blessing for you. I pray that the Spirit will give you courage to be a peacemaker. I pray that you will be able to rest in the witness of Thomas and know that the resurrected Lord is amongst us. God is with you. The Spirit will empower you to do the work that God is calling you to do. Step out in faith. God bless you.
Let us bring our prayers for the world. Living God in Christ, we proclaim that this is your world, infused with your glory, the glory of the one who brings life and peace. Christ's resurrection enables us to proclaim your life when everything seems to speak of death, your hope when all around screams despair, your strength where there is only fragility, your confidence in the midst of uncertainty, your faithfulness in the face of infidelity, your love when everything seems to speak of fear, your trust where there is only doubt, and your peace in the midst of anxiety. And so loving God, help us to proclaim and to embody your life, your hope, your strength, your confidence, your faithfulness, your love, your trust, and your peace in our current situations, in our families, our communities, governments, institutions of health, research, education and learning in the nations of your world. God of abundant life, your peace be with us and in your world. And so let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this time of worship. Uh, let me lead you in a word of mission and a blessing. Go out into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted. Honour all people. Rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you now and always. God bless you. Bye for now.